Hey y'all, producer Drew here. April is National Poetry Month, and conveniently our host and CMA writer in residence, Ray McManus, is about to release a brand new book of poetry entitled The Last Saturday in America, published by Hub City Press. This book tackles the subject of Southern masculinity through examinations of suburban neighbors, bullies, gun violence, and vasectomy appointments. Today, I'll be channeling my inner Terry Gross and interviewing Ray on his book and what makes him tick. Welcome to Binder. I'm Drew Barron. Ray, great to have you on the show. Thanks, Drew. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy National <laughs> Poetry Month. <laughs> Thanks, man. It is, um, you know, T.S. Eliot says it's the cruelest month. Um, and when I look at the dates on my book tour, I think I know what he's talking about. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, but National Poetry Month is always a fun month. Uh, you know, if you look at American literature, I mean, poetry is such a vital part mm-hmm. of that canon. And certainly um, here in the South, where you have an entire region that is poetry in and of itself, right? Plus, you know, I mean, it's apropos. I mean, we're steeped in tragedy and and inherit um, an abundance of sadness along the way. And I think those are great things for poetry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Man, you're going to make this hard to follow up. Um, You know, we've talked a lot on the show about what got you into poetry. We, We know, we know, Ed. Madden, big influence. We love Ed on the show. That's why mm-hmm. Ed's been on the show many times. We don't need to retread that ground, but like I am kind of interested to know, um, you know, poetry isn't the only literary art form, right? right. Um, but it is the one that keeps bringing you back. Have you ever thought about like dabbling in other types of writing or is it just that it just doesn't appeal to you? Like what, what keeps bringing you into poetry? A compulsion, uh, probably. Uh, I have written short stories. I've written essays, a lot of creative nonfiction. Um, but what ends up happening uh, a lot of times, I don't have really the time for it. Mm. You know, I mean, I think to write the long form, you, you really have to have set time every day, um, devote yourself to it. And I just don't have the lifestyle for that right now with kids growing up and moving out and you know, Lindsay and I still have, you know, linen and she's a dance every night. You know, I yeah. think she dances like six nights a week, man. It's insane. Uh, you know, and work. Um, and so I will start writing something, you know, a story maybe, or even an essay that's inevitably going to turn itself into a poem. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other part to that is that, you know, I will use longer forms when, you know, I feel like I haven't been writing because I'm thinking too much about what I want a poem to do when I just need to just sit down and write. And so it's kind of a relief in a way because I'm not thinking about beats per line. I'm not thinking about line breaks. I'm not thinking of any of those things. And I'm just writing. Um, But, you know, back to the timing issue, you know, I spend five hours writing that. I may take, you know, seven words out of that that becomes a poem. Um, So I have to be very selective um, with my time so I can be productive. And I think, too, there's a lot to be said for that inner voice. Um, and so I could write a story. I could write an essay. I've, I've got friends I can share that with, but I don't trust the inner voice like I do with a poem. When you say inner voice, um, I'm skipping ahead on our list of questions here uh, for everyone at home that doesn't see the list of questions that we have. But <laughs> what is this inner voice? Is it your inner voice? Because, I mean, a lot of the poems in this new book that we're about to talk about really feel like they come from a real personal mm-hmm. place. I mean, yeah. when you hear that inner voice, are you hearing it as yourself or are you hearing it kind of as a voice that is taking on the thoughts and minds of those around you? What What is that? Yeah, I mean, I think. I, I do think, I, I mean, I do hear other voices like, you know, I'll still hear Kwame's voice. I'll still hear Ed's voice. Um, I definitely hear Lindsay's voice. Lindsay's my first reader for everything. And what I think the inner voice is, is an amalgamation of, of these voices sort of serve as a, an aesthetic compass sometimes. Mm. I'll write something and I'll, I'll look at the line and I, just know something's not right with it. I'll hear Kwame, you know, man, you can't do that, man. 
Um, or I'll write something that is very visceral and and explicit and you know, I'll hear Lindsay's voice going, you know, you don't have to talk like that all the time. Um, so, um, and there are times when that's all I need. Um, but, but I do think that's a good question, Drew. It's, it's, it's my voice. I yeah. mean, you know, it's a gut feeling um, more than something I'm hearing in my head. But I probably have to tune out if I do have an inner voice that that is mine. I have to tune it out sometimes because it's the one. It's like, nah, man, this is fine. Let's let it go. You know, <laughs> you know go outside. You know, wow, your inner voice and my inner voice are the exact opposite, <laughs> right? You know, like you know, just just let it go. You know, but yeah, I think I th- I think it's a combination really of my teachers, um, and I do include Lindsay in that group because those are those are voices and people that I trust. So this book that's coming out, Mm -hmm. it's your first book in, what, 10 years? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, listeners at home wouldn't have heard our conversation from last week, but Ray was telling me how he was on another podcast uh, that isn't Binder. (laughs) And (laughs) he was being interviewed and somebody had brought up, you know, this this gap of time between... uh, this book and the one that's about to be released, because up to that point you were releasing pretty frequently every couple mm-hmm. of years. Yeah. And so I was, I, I kept thinking about that and I kept thinking about that and I kept thinking about that. And I was like doing the math and I was like, well, 2014, 2014, what happened in 2014? And then I thought, you know what? I started working at the museum in 2014. And then Ray and I started working together pretty quickly after that. Yeah. Am I the reason that yeah. it took you a decade to write this book, Ray? You're, you're totally the reason, Drew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um no, buddy. You're you're if nothing else, you're you're a reason why I kept wanting to keep writing this book. I mean, um there's a combination of elements, I think. One is, you know, every book the process is different. You know, the first book were poems that I had had written in grad school, you know, and then as, you know, I started you know, I'm working on the PhD program and, uh, and I'm working on trying to get this manuscript to be something publishable. Then it was, you know, okay, what do, what do I have and how can I put these together, arrange these together and that sort of thing and fill in the gaps. Red Dirt Jesus, uh, the second book, really kind of started out with an idea. And I started writing poems uh, for that idea. And then at the same time, I started watching a lot of spaghetti western um and watching a lot of Sergio Leone films and so there's a lot of that going on in there you know I mean I think it's the good the bad and the ugly fit fine with the trinity so it takes some interesting turns but a, a book that I was sort of working on really from the start punch very similar as well you know, really wanted to write a book about the working class as an as an ode or as homage to it. And um, so I had an idea, you know, even though the book takes a lot of different shifts and changes. Um, but right after that one, I was reading um, a book called American Manhood. At the same time, I was reading also uh, Caveman Mystique and immediately was becoming like hyper defensive of everything I'm reading in this thing about men, about masculinity, and like, no, 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 this is wrong. This is how it is maybe in the Northeast, this is as in the West, but I don't know if that's what you could say in the South. And mm-hmm. about at the same time, I was reading these books and having sort of these discussions. You know, we had just had Lenin in 08, and it was one of those situations where my wife was in delivery Things got really complicated, uh, and she almost she almost stroked out. I mean, honestly. Um, afterwards, you know, when I went with her to the doctor's appointment, and doctors were you know talking to her about you know look chances of you going and completing you know a, a full term you know in the future are pretty slim. Um, mm-hmm. That you know most likely can be fatal. And then immediately after that, start talking about all the procedures, you know, that 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 they could do for her, you know, all these invasive things. Right. You know, things that they can remove, things that she can add, all the stuff. And I'm just sitting in the chair like a typical guy, you know, like, okay, well, you know, this doesn't sound fun, you know. Um, And then it hit me like, well, why don't I just get a vasectomy? That way we don't have to worry about this problem. 
And, and it really wasn't a difficult decision to make at all. But what was interesting was after that decision and meeting with the urologist and going to and, you know, back and forth to those offices and sitting in there in the office with a lot of guys a lot older than I am are there for different reasons. Yeah. Uh, but the men that I was interacting with on the ball field, you know, my son's playing baseball and all this stuff, when I would talk about the fact that you know, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to be at practice Friday. I get, I'm getting a vasectomy, you know, and, and, you know, and all these guys are just like, dude, what? You know, like, like, you know, like, it's okay. I, you know, I'm not getting castrated, man. It's just a vasectomy. It's a very simple procedure. And just the, the look of shock on their face, like, you know, well, how can you just openly talk about this? And why would you do this? And I would never do this. And so that kind of struck me, you know, like, like, why, what is it about that, that, you know, so I applied for a RISE grant um, and got it. And the whole idea was I wanted to, to write a chat book about vasectomies and men's health. And it was okay. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it, you know, it, it was nice to write through those experiences and to write through all the things. So it was a pretty scary time up to that point. But the book wanted to do something. It wanted to be more than that. And so I, I, I tried to, you know, started looking at more of just the domestic sort of living and thinking about being a man and, you know, growing up in the South and in the 21st century. And what does that even mean? You know, by this point, we've hit about 2016, just when you think America can't get any worse. Right. But what hit me were, were, were two juxtaposing images that we were seeing so much of on the news. You know, the first one was, of course, the Women's March, um, which you could not look at a television screen and see so many people out there and wouldn't be moved by that, that there was, you know, a civilized outrage that was going throughout the country. And, and to see that was inspiring. And I don't use that word loosely. And then juxtaposing that image with this image of these little boys, these incels, you know, marching around in Virginia with their polo shirts and khaki pants and tiki torches and, you know, and all their anger and vitriol. And then hearing the news constantly talking about this new face of masculinity. So it really concerned me at the time about you know, I, I've got a son, I, you know, I'm around all these other men. What is this country going to look like if somebody doesn't step up and say, you know, look, guys, this is wrong. And, and here's why it's wrong. And, and here's where it went wrong. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, then we get hit with this pandemic, right? There was this prevailing sense that, you know, wait a minute, Everything that I've been conditioned to do and programmed to do to be this provider, to be this protector, you know, I'm the man of the house. Um, I'm just as scared as everybody else. And, and you know, to be honest with you, I, and I couldn't have seen it then uh, as much as I do now, how much I actually loved that time of hmm. being at home with my family. And I felt like, you know, I got to know my family at, at a more concrete level, um, you know, because before we were just, we were working, everybody's working, everybody's got their thing. You know, you, you, you rush home, if you're lucky, you, you grabbed a, a cookie or two, and then, you know, you're throwing a kid in a car and taking them to a ball field. Hopefully it's yours. Um, and, you know, th th you're just back and forth, back and forth. And now all of a sudden everything stopped and we're all together. So while I'm trying to write about all the stuff going on after 2016, the stuff with the masculinity, you got everything going on, too, with, you know, a lot of the protests that, that really spawn across the country again after uh, George Floyd. But during that pandemic, um, I think that's when it kind of hit me it was that, you know, maybe I don't need to be trying so hard to be the protector and the savior and all this stuff. Maybe it's more along the lines of, you know, I signed up to be a partner in this. And that means if there's a partner, then there needs to be more than one voice here. Yeah. Um, and so I did a lot more shutting up and listening. I know that might be hard for our listeners to believe that. Um, it's but, pretty hard for me to believe yeah, right now. And, and watched. Um, and we also watched a lot of TV. Um, and so the book really kind of moves around from looking at sort of the origins of the way Southern masculinity manifests itself 
which I don't think is necessarily Southern. It's also, you know, because it is very national. No, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would totally agree with you. Sorry not to cut you off, but it's just like I really off. wanted to bring that up because, you know, when I read this book, I, I'm not prototypically Southern, mm-hmm. right? Like I, my dad's from Canada, my mom's from California. I did more or less grow up in the South, but I am the most Southern of my family, which is a very non-Southern family. Right. Uh, but this book, was so relatable to me, Mm -hmm. Um, especially the whole first section that's kind of dealing with like adolescence and kind of that movement from being a boy, being a teenager into being a man. And it just I, I was really struck by how much of it I related to personally. There were so many things in this that are things I've thought myself that I thought I was the only one thinking them, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, and so in a lot of ways, it's like I'm so grateful that I took the time to sit down and read this, um, not only because I never read and it's just good for you. <laughs> it is good for you. But like, like because it really it really touched me in a way that I wasn't expecting. And I'm not just saying this because we know each other. Right. Like I, I mean this very genuinely. Like I was really surprised how much I related to what's in this book. And I think it's because you've really tapped into a lot of like universal ideas, at least in this country, Mm -hmm. on what makes masculinity and what factors are affecting that. Right. Right. Like, so, I mean, it is it is your upbringing, but it also is all of these other outside voices. It's TV. It's media. Yep. It's your family. It's uh, the guy on the street. It's the man in the barbershop. It's the man in the gun shop. Right. Like. Mm -hmm they're all also defining to you externally what it means internally to be a man. And I think that that is really, really fascinating. And you do such a good job of just like breaking that down. Like each one Mm. of these poems really looks at that from a different angle, but then they also all just kind of work together as a whole. What I was struck by, and I mean, granted, I don't read a lot of books of poetry, right? Mm. But what I didn't realize was how much of a through line it was going to feel like it had. It really feels... Like it could have been a novel, right? Like because there is like a narrative structure of like moving Mm -hmm. from childhood into adulthood into, you know, whatever happens next. Right. And the struggles that a lot of us face when we, you know, we always talk about like becoming our fathers, right? (laughs) Um, And I think that you really illustrate that very well in this and how it's like to a certain degree, some of that is inevitable, but that doesn't mean that you have to hold all the same ideas. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I know it's a really rambly, complicated way to go about talking about all this. of it. <laughs> uh, but it's it's because there's a there's a lot in here. There's a lot to yeah. like weigh. Well, it it did take ten years. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, and and thank you for that, Drew. I mean, um, because that ultimately uh, is the goal. If we only write from how we feel about things personally as poets, then it makes it very hard for our readers to relate to it. You know, the struggle is to take something personal and try to find its universal thread. Because I do think that there are so many influences as to why we shape masculinity to, you know, the way we do today. I wish it was as simple as, you know, well, if, you know, it's doing this one thing. So yeah. if we just don't do that one thing, then we're all good. Fathers or, don't ever say this to your son. Right. It's you know, clickbait uh, title there. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, it, it just it it was one of those things where it was going to require a lot of trust um, that what I was doing, a reader is going to see. And there are some calculated gambles in this book um, that time will tell, um, you know, and but so far what I'm hearing back is folks coming back and talking about how much they related to it. And that's probably the greatest compliment I think you can get as a poet. You know, somebody looks at my poems like, you know, I just I love what you do with sonnets. I mean, I feel good about that. But the person off the street's not going to do that. I don't even know what a sonnet is. Right. right. You would if you saw one. Um, (laughs) Did I in this book? (laughs) I I, I mean, I don't know. There may be mix sonnets in there, you know, like uh, but when somebody says and and I'll hear this at at a poetry reading, you know, like, hey, this is first poetry reading I ever went to. This is. The first book I'd sat down and read cover to cover, you know, a book of poetry that I read cover to cover. And I really related to this. I, I've, I felt something here. This touched me. Man, I can't think of a, a better compliment. Yeah. Um, and, and so now that voice will be in my head. So thanks, Drew. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. I, you know, one of the poems uh, that I related to right away was the very first one. Mm. Rasslin'. Rasslin', yeah. Um, 
And I have asked Ray not to read it because mm-hmm. uh, the ending has a word that we're not allowed to say on this program. We'll just say fudge for <laughs> our friends at home. American as fudge. American as fudge. But, you know, like when a memory just like unlocks in your brain, yeah. uh, this did that for me. Mm-hmm. Like wrestling specifically did that for me. Now, for our listeners at home who've probably not had an opportunity to read the book yet, the poem kind of illustrates a couple of, you know, kids roughhousing, pretending to be their favorite wrestlers. Before I get too far into this, I actually had a question around that. Who was your favorite wrestler, Ray? Um, Do you have one? I, I wrestlers. Uh, oh, okay. The, the Road Warriors were my favorite. They seemed kind of real, where everybody else were very pretty. You know, it was back at a time of, of Saturday morning cartoons, right? Um, which, you know, so many generations after are missing out on what that moment was like for a kid growing up. Yeah. Um, and Saturday mornings, you'd get up, you, you'd, you'd watch usually the Super Friends or Thunder the Barbarian or something like that. You know, you'd watch the other ones too. You just wouldn't tell your friends if you were watching Smurfs and that kind of thing. But then wrestling would come on at about 1130. You know, and you got about 30 minutes of it. And then Soul Train or American Bandstand, whatever you might have been oh, that's watching. so weird. I didn't know that's how they used to program it. Yeah. I always, like, when I was a kid, it was always evenings. It was, like, prime time. You know oh, what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. they put it on at, like, 8 p.m., 9 p.m. Yeah. Uh, I've, <laughs> daytime. It, it, was, it was very, very low budget. Um, I mean, you know, and then the upper parts of it, like, the top shelf stuff was, like, you know, the WF or WWF or whatever with, Hulk Hogan and and all those guys and I and we didn't really watch as much of that, but we would watch it when it came on. Of course, you know you see somebody like George the Animal Steel eating the turnbuckle, you know, like you know, I mean, you <laughs> yeah. know, and you know, as a kid, you're just captivated by that. But it wasn't real. We knew it wasn't real, but yet we would be so locked in intently watching this, only for us to at some point, whether it was that day or that weekend or the following, inevitably we would end up wrestling um, and trying the moves, you know, putting each other in figure fours and hammer locks and oh, the Boston Crab, that was brutal, um, you know. And, you know, we're like in the middle of a dirt road doing this kind of stuff and sweaty and just sliding off of each other. But the whole idea, of course, was, to, you know, who's going to be king of the rock pile? Who's going to be the, the alpha male? And yet don't even realize just how wonderfully gay all of that was yeah i mean it's it's really weird because they very much portray it as these are the like most masculine like yes manly men that there can ever be a bunch of oily guys wrestling with speedos on and occasionally one would reach down into his speedo and pull out brass knuckles like how where was those where were those <laughs> how did that come you know and and for for impressionable you know preteens and and young teenagers that was probably the first sort of hypocrisy that we're that we're dealing with that um, we weren't really sure what to do with it. You right. know, I mean, except, you know, let's wrestle. But, you know, while that's going on at night, you know, we're watching primetime television where you've got two men want to get a, you know, want to live in an apartment, but it's all women. So they dress up as women to live in the apartment. That's totally fine. Totally normal. Oh, let's watch this other show. This is the U.S. Army. Here's a guy who wants a Section 8. So he dresses up as a woman the entire time. Hey, that's totally normal. Oh, here's another. Here's a movie about a guy who wants to get a job. And the only way he can get a job is if he's a woman. So totally normal, right? And like nobody looked around and questioned like, hey, this is, this is, these are very interesting aspects of masculinity. Because the moment we walked out to the church or to Cub Scouts or whatever we were doing, then it was a totally different vibe. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the difference, at least that they would have argued at the time, is that it was played for laughs. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, it's all like, fun and it was all, It's all fun and games and fine as long as it's for laughs. Yep. Which I think, you know, leaves a lot of people out of the conversation, to be honest. Um, oh, it totally does. Or, you know, leaves a lot of people <clears throat> as the butt of the joke uh, unfairly, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think the way that men have been portrayed in the media is, you know, it's a it's a long topic and probably one that we don't have all the time in the world yeah. to take for this podcast. But I mean, it is it is problematic. And I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, people questioning that now. Like, are these ideals that are being presented even real? And I think at the end of wrestling, you kind of get to that point at the heart of it when you just 
go, you know, it's American as fudge. <laughs> and none of it's real. And none of it's real. Um, well, I mentioned that the, when we just started talking about this, that I kind of had this like unlocked memory. And I wanted to hold it for the end because I knew that this would be like fun and this memory wasn't. So like I didn't want to I didn't want to sour the mood right away. But, um, <laughs> you know. Obviously, as a kid, like we used to do that kind of stuff all the time, right? You right. know, wrestle and, you know, I'm going to be, I'm stone cold and like all that. Um, and I remember vividly, I, I grew up, for people that don't know me, I grew up on Paris Island, which is a Marine Corps training base, which is, uh, you want to talk about some toxic yeah. masculine energy. Just roll your window uh, down. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, comes just right in. everywhere. Um, and my next door neighbor was a drill sergeant and he had a kid and me and his kid used to hang out a lot. And, you know, we would do stuff like that. We would like wrestle around, joke around. I remember one time I was out in the front yard and we were doing exactly that. We were just like wrestling around and his dad came out and he was just, he was just mad as hell. You know what I mean? He was just, it started out mad as hell. And, uh, I think I made the mistake of being like, Hey man, like, why are you, why are you yelling like this? You know? And he took me Ray and he threw me in the most devastating headlock. But it's like not like a oh for fun headlock. It's like a, I couldn't breathe and he's choking me out and like has me on the ground and mm. basically told me uh, to learn to respect uh, the men above me, you mm. know. And that was like one of those things that was really formative. It really sat with me for a long time and it made me like hate that culture. Oh, yeah. Like very much so. And I think that in a way it's kind of a good thing because I think it pushed me out of growing up to be something like that be right. very early because I recognized. How much I hated that. Yeah, I think looking back, I mean, I think my whole adolescence was punctuated by other fathers like that, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, were raging alcoholics. And then I'd be over, you know, you know, with my friend um, and, you know, and his dad's on a bad drunk and coming in there and, and thinking I said something when I didn't, yeah. you know, and then felt like, you know, being goaded and like wanting to fight or something, you know, and I'm like, dude, I'm 13 years old, you right. know, and you're however old you are. And, you know, I think, Drew, it comes down, I think that's the first time that trust is breached for us as kids. And when we look at our uh, elders or, or the adults, uh, you know, um, because up to that point, we're led to believe that no matter what, they're, they'll take care of us. They will uh, look out for us. You know, all these things that, you know, we're told and then we spend a better part of the rest of our adolescence learning. That's not so true. Uh, Is that why you kind of, you know, centered that first section on sort of the adolescent experience? Yes, yeah, so because I think that I think that ultimately your adolescent experience is what's going to shape how you see yourself. I mean, for 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 boys that's going to be how they see themselves as men um, yeah. and how they're going to grow up to be the kinds of men that they think that they want to be. When you grow up in a small town like I grew up in, you don't have a lot of examples. I mean, you know, even stuff that didn't even get in the book, but like I remember there were men in the church when Rock Hudson died and then it was out that, that he died of AIDS and then it was out that, you know, he, got, he contracted AIDS because he was a homosexual. Men were outraged and upset, not because this actor that they, you know, in many ways probably, you know, tried to emulate because, you know, he was a man's man. It wasn't that, you know, a hero of theirs died. It was that we never knew he was gay. Like, you know, that was that was the heartbreaking part to them. And I'm like, and I'm just sitting there going, OK, what difference does that make if it was your hero and you didn't know? I mean, how 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 were you betrayed by any of this? So even at the ripe old age of like 10 or 11, things didn't make sense. But I do think that the way we are treated and, you know, just like that guy doing that to you, you know, it stays with you. Mm. Um, it affects the way you see the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you're growing through that. Uh, at a time when you're basically a sponge, right? So all the stuff is coming in. You don't even know it's coming in. You know, like uh, I'm reminded of this by my kids sometimes. They'll tell me something that I said, and I'm like, I don't remember saying that. Well, you weren't talking to us. You were talking to somebody else. And, and I'm like, damn, y'all heard that? <laughs> like, and I suddenly feel the need to add context to it. And they're like, Dad, we, we, we know what you meant, you know. But we, we just, we don't know how those things are going to 
transpire later. Uh, and unfortunately for some, by the time they do know it, it's too late. They've crossed over a threshold that, you know, and I mean, this is the worst of the worst, right? Where suddenly now all idea of what is right and what is wrong is just gone. Um, there is no distinction. That is damnable to any thriving community. Um, so, you know, I grew up with, with guys that that happened to, um, and, you know, they ended up doing heinous, heinous things uh, and are in jail for the rest of their lives or killed in the process. Uh, and I can't help but wonder, you know, what influenced them when they were younger. We'll be right back. Ray, I'd love to ask you to Ray, I'd love to ask you to read something for us. Sure. Um I was hoping maybe you could read Hurricane Season. Yeah. So, you know, Hurricane Season inland is always a weird time for us, you know. When you live on the coast, hurricane season's no joke. You know, they're talk about being prepared. You're constantly prepared. You're, You're constantly evacuating. Yeah. Like at least once to twice a year. Right. Uh, but here in the Midlands, it was always like, it's coming. It's going to be a bad one. You know, be prepared. I'm like, for what? I mean, for, for people coming here off the coast? Okay, no problem. Um, so go to the grocery store before they show up. Gotcha. You know, that's about all I got out of them. Um, but it does sort of remind me of the ideas of, of these things coming that, that don't come. And while we're so focused on that, we forget that other things are coming. Hurricane season inland. Because this one, a tree, a truck, and no seatbelt. Because we'll have to wait for toxicology, maybe the weather. Because we know this road, old Charleston Highway, the uphill turn, the bloated body in the ditch. So we call it. Drunk kid asleep at the wheel, too young for a bad heart, too old to listen to anyone who said stay. Always in a rush, they'll say. What a waste, they'll say. We saw this coming. Because that's the business of hurricane season, to break from dead boys and ditches to prepare for what may never come. Because that's how we live. Because that's the prediction we depend on, a cone of probability just wide enough that it might touch us. Because you'd think we've gotten used to the tracking by now. A dozen or so late summer mornings multiplied by 17 years, multiplied by 100, divided by the number of wrecks between churning furloughs through sex and heat, same face, same words, every year, the same year. Because the truth is, we won't see a drop from this system. We won't even feel the wind coming or going. Because even when disappointed, a weatherman's face can make it easy to forget that some kids die alone like that, face down and whispering against rising water. Hmm. You know, in the book, Where That Lands, it's, it's in the first section, but it's near the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that was kind of the first mention of death in this mm -hmm. book. Uh, but that is a pretty prevailing theme throughout the book, right? Um, yeah. you, you talk about it quite a bit. Is this something that you think about personally a lot? Probably more now than I did when I was younger. Um, you know, something about when you when you hit the big five zero, you mm. start you start realizing my time on Earth is going to be less now than what it was up to this point, unless I live to be a hundred. But I don't think that's you know in the cards. Um, you know, I mean, the, the way I lived when I was younger is inevitably going to come back. To be fair, every interview I've ever seen with a centurion like drinks whiskey every day and smokes a whole pack of cigarettes. Right. So, <laughs> so, so there's really no telling. I think yeah. it's a genetics thing more than anything. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe there's hope. But yeah, it it is something that I do think about because that's a theme that that I think keeps popping up in a variety of different ways. So early on, it's being reminded of it that our time here on Earth is is short, and that there's so much of it around us we don't even know it. Like we we don't want it to be a part of life in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And when it is, you know, that's it's hard for us to deal with it. 
So it's, it's easy for us to forget it. And I think, unfortunately, um, when we're younger is probably when we need to be honestly told more about it. Um, because, you know, we think we're invincible at that age, you know. It's not going to happen to us. And then it happens to a best friend, which did for me on a couple of occasions. Um, those kinds of things should be, when they happen, should be a reminder of, hey, you know, life is short. Pay attention to things, you know, be good to others, love everyone, uh, only for us to get into our day to day again. And then within a couple of days, weeks, months, year, whatever, we're back to what we were doing before. Yeah. Right. Then I start thinking about how death works when we start to have families. Because now it's about, you know, I don't want to leave these people. Um, I don't want it to be harder for them. But then I also think, what am I leaving them if I do? And so, you know, it's that sort of inventory we take, you know, somewhere usually hits us, you know, it depends, but usually late 20s, early 30s. Where am I? Where am I going? How much farther do I have to go? Have I achieved any goals along the way? And so death becomes that sort of reminder. And then towards the end, it really is about, you know, this idea of, you know, running out of time. I think there's a message here that the speaker is really trying to find. And if he can articulate it, and maybe his kids will be different. If he can articulate it, maybe his neighbors will be different. Uh, only for him to realize this whole entire time, maybe he's not the one that has to deliver the message. Maybe he should step back and let others deliver the message. And that's where the wife really comes in in this book. Um, but it's the idea that things are disappearing. We are disappearing. How much do I give away? How much do I take? How much do I tell the kids about life? How much do I let them figure some of that out on their own? You know, and then I think, too, the speaker is also realizing in, the, in this book, he doesn't have the answers. That was something I think early on for me personally, realizing that just because you've reached ages of 30s and 40s and 50s, you didn't suddenly be given a book with all the answers. But as a kid, that's what you thought with adults. They had all the answers. And if you ask why? Because they said so. That's why. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and then even if you get to that point and you are ready to try to give an answer, uh, will it be received? Right. right? Uh, I think later on in the book, and uh, forgive me because I can't remember which poem it is. I didn't write it down because um, mm -hmm. it really impacted me like that. No, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, just what you were saying really reminded me of uh, when the speaker reveals his cancer to his children and yeah. their immediate response is to fight over his clothes. Right. Like. Right. It's like it's not received right. uh, because either they're too young to understand or uh, the chaos of the day to day, as you were saying a moment ago, is just too overbearing to like even wrap your head around an idea like that. Yeah. And I think that in itself sort of has an effect on how we view our masculinity, right? Like, will I be able to grow into the man that I wanted to be before it's too late? Exactly. Yep. Yep. And then. Growing into the man that I want to be, what is the man I want to be? And these are questions we should be asking ourselves. Um, we don't because, you know, that's also part of the programming. You don't talk about stuff. Men don't talk about this kind of stuff. Right. When, in fact, we should. We should be asking ourselves, what kind of man do I want to be? And can I grow into that man before it's too late, before I leave the earth? If we have more of those questions, then, then maybe, just maybe, a, we grow into exactly the kind of men that we want to be, but then we become a more inclusive representation of what a man not should be, but can be, you know, which is much different than the way we were brought up when it was a man is, yeah. you know, and yet I just didn't buy it. I mean, and I still don't. As a poet, I had to dive headfirst into it and see if there was a way I could unravel that. Because I think, you know, on a personal level, I'm still trying to figure that part out myself. Maybe that's the quest, Drew. Maybe, maybe it's not that, that we'll ever achieve the answer. It's the fact that we're on the quest to find the answer. I don't know if that's something I can say about myself, right? I couldn't say, hey, I'm a good man. No more, I'm a good dad. I'm a good husband. If I'm saying all that, that means nothing. It's only going to be best represented by my actions. 
and our actions are dictated a lot by our thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to switch gears a little bit here All right. uh, and talk about the uh, title of the book, The Last Saturday in America. Sure. A few things I noticed. One is that uh, Saturday, not the only day of the week mentioned in this book. Uh, and you, you were, you were, <laughs> I know, very, very observant. Me, yeah. you know, I, I want people there's, to know I know the days a of the Sunday. week. Sunday, yeah, and th- that seems irrelevant, right? But it's not mm-hmm. because you mentioned earlier, kind of that day to day, and how that really affects the life of the speaker here in this book and like how it plays a major role in like how they are allowed to navigate the world. Cause I mean, we always have a to-do list, right? Every day of the week, we're thinking about what is happening on the next day of the week. And I think, uh, that really illustrates how a lot of us live. Um, I have sort of a silly question. It is called the last Saturday in America. Mm-hmm. Um, and most people don't know we actually record this on Fridays almost exclusively. Right. <laughs> uh, and so if tomorrow was the last Saturday in America, how would you spend it? Well, just so happens tomorrow I'm emceeing the uh, Poetry Out Loud state competition. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll be there. Um, doing think, what you love. Just doing what I love. Um, and I, I think if it was the last Saturday in America, I think that's just it. Just doing what you love. I mean, I think the other days of the week are often occupied by things we don't love. <laughs> um, you know, there's so much have to's, have to's, have to's, and it's unfair, but you get one day of want to. Like some days we, you know, we set our Saturday to, to try to clean the house. Now, of course, we've got a wonderful lab that, you know, has like, I don't know, multiple shedding seasons. Um, so, you know, there, there are some days, you know, we can't avoid it. Like we've got to sweep and mop because there's dog hair everywhere. But some days, some Saturdays, man, with the exception of laundry, because we know we've got to have clean clothes for the week. Other than that, like we don't feel like doing something. We just don't. And that can be the best Saturday in the world. <laughs> Is that your next book, The Best Saturday? The, in the Best world? Saturday in the World. Yep. That'll You're be welcome. There. You can have that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, even though you said it. <laughs> uh, I would love for you to share that poem, actually. Okay, sure. Because uh, I, I have <clears throat> some other things I want to talk to you about it, but I think uh, listeners should hear it first. All right. The Last Saturday in America. If my neighbor slams his shovel to the ground and stomps across the yard toward the gas can... I should let him. We're not friends, but I offer him water, which he takes, and we talk about roots, good dirt, how that limb just fell one day, the black spot that ate its way down the middle of the trunk. I can't even remember his name. Across the street, the neighborhood stray sniffs the fence line. The new people moved here two weeks ago. They keep their dog chained to the trampoline. My neighbor is quick to recognize a bitch in heat, says someone needs to get that dog fixed or shoot it, and then he's back to the fire he started. The stray, clearly male, matted and thin and desperate for the wreck, claws at the dirt and bites at the gate. It doesn't take long for him to realize that it's easier to jump over the fence than it is to crawl under it. My neighbor never looks up. I won't tell him that he can't burn a stump out that way. I won't tell him that it's easier to cover it and leave it to rot, that he'd be better off blowing the whole thing up and just fill in the hole later. I won't tell him his wife is at the window watching. Man, that poem and quite a few other ones about your neighbors, or not your neighbors, but the the speaker's neighbors. Right. (laughs) I think they really do a great job of describing a very specific type of neighborhood relationship, which is very, very Southern. And that is that everyone has to talk to their neighbors, but no one's ever saying anything because we're all on our toes. (laughs) Yep. uh, Because anything we say might start some sort of weird drama in the neighborhood we live in. And I think that that has gotten even more intense Yes. In the past few years with like the political discourse that we're living with, where we are terrified of having any kind of real conversation with our neighbors about anything. Right. And the thing is, is that, you know, folks move in 
and they don't realize some of the, I don't want to say code, but, but some of the inner workings that we've all sort of appreciated about South Carolina. Like, for instance, the, the, there are people that you would not know if they were Republican or Democrat, mm -hmm. if they were Baptist or Lutheran or Catholic, unless they told you. Um, and then all of a sudden, there's been this, you know, you, you kind of started to see a little bit of it probably about, you know, when Bush was president, but more so, I think, yeah, around 2015, 2016, where people just won't be very open about how they feel and how they think about things. I'm trying to say this without outing any possible neighbor because, you know, these are people I live around. So um, and you're right. These are speaker. This is the speaker's neighbors. Um, they're all of our neighbors. And I do appreciate them. I mean, you know, I they we do kind of look out for each other around the cul-de-sac. You know, we don't hang out or talk because when we have, it's like, OK, <laughs> this one's different. I found that the way I could keep my sanity was by simply not engaging in any of those conversations. And I think in this book, you really identify, I mean, sometimes humorously, it's not always, right. uh, but you really identify like the reality that like you may have come into the neighborhood thinking you weren't going to be a part of it, that I'm going to isolate myself. And you may have these defense mechanisms to like kind of, yeah. but you will be part of the neighborhood. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? Whether you want to be or not. That's right. And I think the speaker of this book is very much a part of his neighborhood, whether he wants to be or not. Yes. You know? And, you know, his feelings about his neighbors aside, uh, I actually, real quick, I do want to ask you, do you plan to give any copies to any of your neighbors? By no. The way? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are, they, they, don't get me wrong. Um, the ones that I write about in here, with the exception of one, um, and he's a Georgia fan, so I don't, I don't care about that. Yeah. <laughs> the, all the others have moved. Um, yeah. You know, so... Um, yeah, that's the other thing. That's the other thing is thinks about living in a, in a neighborhood, you know, folks move out. As soon as you'd get to know somebody, as soon as you get to like them, you know, they got transferred or, the, you know, they were promoted or they split up. Uh, and so they'd move and the new couple would come in and you try to get to know them and you start to like them. Then, then they move. And then after a while, you're just like, I don't give a shit who lives here. I mean, you know, please don't tear up the place. Um, we do have some folks, though, that are sort of emblematic of, of some of the neighbors that are in this book that forget that they live in a neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. you know, because there is a give and take. You are basically conceding to the fact that you are not living independently in the woods anymore. So you can't just walk outside butt naked or at 2.30 in the morning decide, you know, ooh, you've installed a new train horn on your truck. So wouldn't it be funny to, you know, blow that at 2.30 in the morning, you know, when everybody's trying to sleep and go to work the next day, you know? So there's a part of me that has to deal with that. And the other part of me is like, holy crap, I'm turning into my dad. <laughs> like, I'm out there on the porch yelling at the kids to slow down and, and get off my lawn, you know? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be that guy. But Ultimately, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I think that's what the speaker realizes, is that regardless of how he may be different from his neighbors, they are his neighbors. He is a part of that neighborhood, just as the speaker is male, he's a man, yeah. and he's a part of the things that he wants to be different from, but he will always be a part of it. Um. You perfectly segue, Ray. I don't even know if you realize you did this, but you just uh, said that there's a lot of give and take. Mm. Uh, and I would really love you to read the give and take, which is okay. another poem here in your new book. Yes. And in that one, I want to make sure I talk a little bit about afterwards because I want to make a distinction. The give and take. The line starts every exhibit, one display then the next. Always an origin, always a narrative and stop motion, how one simple movement stretches towards epoch, how time gives in to the excuses we make, how men raise their arm to push back the sky, how the sky lets them trophy a familiar privilege. Museums work like that, build monuments out of what's given and what's taken away. We've seen the mammoth, the contents of its stomach, We've seen the blankets behind the glass and know who shivers in the dark and who doesn't. Every exhibit, 
one display and then the next. Lines for a narrative, a song that pays homage to a history of work we should have done better. So I have no issue with art museums. Um, and here's why. There was always more inclusion in the narrative that you see in an art museum. You know, there are gay artists, straight artists, men, women, people of color. Um, you go into an art museum. I remember the first time I'd ever seen uh, Edgefield Pottery was in an art museum. And, you know, that's fine. Even though sometimes, and, and recently I think we've seen more of a shift where it's better, um, that there were times when, you know, the elite structures might dictate how those narratives sometimes would come across. Yeah. But you go into, like, the museums of, you know, sort of natural history or, his, you know, history museums, the Smithsonian, any of these places. These are fine museums for learning. You learn things. You'll see things. But one of the things that I was always struck with going through those was that you always would see on this exhibit are more great men. And now let's go to another exhibit and see more great men. And over here is more great men. And it kind of fits within, I think, the sort of Americanized version of history. Yeah, I mean, right? it's the historical narrative, right? The historical narrative. And it's always punctuated by, you know, white, wealthy, powerful, strong men. You know, I remember seeing the portrait of Andrew Jackson yeah, and listening to the person talk about Andrew Jackson as president of the United States and also fighting the British in the War of 1812 and then talks about the song, right? No mention of the Trail of Tears. <laughs> no mention at all of it, you know? Um, or, you know, I remember hearing about uh, Ben Tillman um, and, you know, no talking at all about uh, the massacres. You know, so much of what we see in history, you know, we should know them. We should learn from them, but not celebrate them. So it doesn't mean we're going to take away the ugly parts and only focus on the good parts of it. We need the ugly parts, of course, but we need to be honest about the ugly parts. That keeps us from hopefully repeating those same mistakes. I remember as a kid learning about the American Industrial Revolution. All of that being on the backs of workers, yep. workers that lived in deplorable conditions, yep. um, you know, were perfectly fine with those factories and those textile mills, you know, working kids as young as eight, and nine years old. And, you know, that's a part that we didn't talk about here growing up. We didn't talk about that at all. Right. But yet, you know, Rockefeller, you know, that's a great man. Look at all the money he made. So I, I, I do take issue with that, with that narrative um, because I do think that the more productive narrative is like, look, we did something. We could have done that better. <laughs> you can't ignore the fact that our history is tragic and brutal. And, you know, you, you can't talk about America's greatness and not talk about the atrocities that we committed in order to achieve this quote unquote greatness. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think to kind of take it back to where, what we've been talking about from the very beginning, like these are the male role models that were taught early on. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't take a lot of research to find a lot of holes in the narrative that were presented in history class. Oh, yeah. Um, but these are the people that we're supposed to be looking up to and revering and modeling ourselves after and wanting to be like. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe they aren't always the best role model. I mean, like, not to cast that. I mean, you know, who am I to cast judgment? What do I know? Right. You know what I mean? But, like, I just, I think ultimately it is another factor that helps define, like, what the masculine identity in American culture is, right? These yeah. powerful men that have help build this culture with their bare hands. Let's not talk about all the other hands that actually did the work for them, right? right? We have just sort of developed kind of an imaginary culture around what it means to be a man, like whether it be from yes. what we learned in school, what we saw on TV, what our families told us being a man should be. Yep. I mean, all of these factors have helped create a narrative that just isn't what it is. And right. I mean, I know that we've said that multiple times in this podcast and someone listening at home is like, 
yeah, we get it. But I mean, it is like an important point because to some people, me saying this alone is blasphemy. Like they couldn't hear that. You know, yeah. um, because how I identify being a man, because I do, I think of myself as masculine. I think of myself as a man, but I don't think that everyone would define me that way, you know, based on their presumptions of what that's supposed to be. Right. Because it is a personal definition. Yeah, right. F- sure. And so that's probably the biggest joke of them all. You're not a man by my definition. Yeah. Like, but when you when you blow that up to a collective or even a national sort of idea, then that becomes problematic because then you've got the next generation of boys growing up thinking that there is this prescription. They just follow that and then voila. Mm-hmm. Um, and only to find out what you found out, what I found out, what so many people found out when they hit their 20s of, OK, some of that stuff I learned. Fair enough. That was true. But the vast majority of what I learned really was just somebody else's interpretation of yeah. the way things are. And, you know, when you think about masculinity, I mean, we're talking centuries and centuries. Going all the way back to the beginning, really, of one man deciding to write down, OK, um, men will be in charge. <laughs> you know? And everyone was like, hey, men are in charge. Why? Well, that that guy wrote it, (laughs) you know? It's so outrageous, honestly. I think where people get really upset is when, you know, the thought of questioning one's gender is somehow or another eroding it or, you know, challenging it to the point where we're saying it's, it's dumb and needs to go away. Challenging something doesn't make it go away. If it goes away, then your challenge proved it was weak to begin with and you don't need to have it. If it gets stronger and you've successfully challenged it, you've learned something. It has staying power. I mean, you're totally right. Uh, Ray, we have gone real long. I have one more poem I want you to read and then we'll talk about what I want to talk about with Okay. But uh, the poem's called Nobody's Bargain. Mm. And this is one that I I really, it just really stuck out to me. All right. Nobody's bargain. I watch her and she watches me moving from office to den to backyard and then den to office to backyard again. The side grins between sliding glass doors, then office to kitchen to den to bathroom to office to bed. And then the morning comes. Fast. Another day moves faster than the one before until it feels like it's not moving at all. And there's mornings where we yell because another day moves louder than the one before until it forces us to scream our words if we have anything to say. And I hear her, and she hears me moving from pantry to fridge to stove to porch to stove again, running into furniture and cursing the ash on the carpet. And I hear her ask what's wrong, and she hears me say nothing, because my throat hurts, and I don't know if I can smell what's cooking or burning, and nothing can distract me from the fact that I could be responsible for killing everyone in this house, or my neighbor's house, or my parents, or her parents, or the cashier at Lowe's Foods where I bought a beer and walked around the store sometime in early spring thinking about how much I liked seeing some of the people in Jasper County, Georgia. How easy it was then to not know anything and just feel, to think distance required agency, to see food on the shelves. And it's at that moment, when I start to question what I cannot taste before I even put it in my mouth, that I feel her hand on my back. And it's at that moment she feels me let go and breathe as I look through the door of the stove Smells good, she says, and I'll be damned. She's right. That poem so perfectly describes my experience when I'm in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It is fear. It is pure fear. Every moment of it is me sweating bullets. Yeah. Grabbing a pan, dropping a pan, 
You know, it's like, as I read that, I just had like PTSD flashbacks to the last time I cooked dinner. (laughs) And I cook dinner a lot, right? Right. I'm not like one of those guys that's like, oh, I don't cook. You know, I do. Yeah. And it never gets better. It's always that level of struggle. And I know that this, I know the poem's about more than that, right? I totally yeah, but get no, that. But no, but that's that's but, a big, big part of it. But <laughs> that is such a real moment. Yeah. And I think it is like, and that's what I'm talking about when I say that this book is relatable, because it's not always like relatable in the, oh, I have all these dark feelings about my childhood. And I mean, right. those are things too. Sure. But there's also moments like this, you know, right. that are a little bit lighter and like really can remind you of what that day to day and like those moments that you should really appreciate in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think what's really important, what I really wanted to get at with you is regardless of how hard it gets, there are people that are on your side, right? There's right. that hand on your back mm-hmm. that's going to tell you that it smells good, right? In, in the form of the wife of the speaker, who mm-hmm. is not Ray's wife, though it might be Ray's wife. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned family quite a bit. And I I think that they're often portrayed in a very positive light throughout Mm -hmm. this book, which makes a lot of sense because I know you and I know your relationship with your family and you've, you've a great family and a great relationship with them. I thought we could kind of end this by kind of talking about family Mm -hmm. and like what that means and like what that means both to this book and just to you in general. Yeah. I mean, I think that image of of the wife putting her hand on on the speaker's back and and saying hey it smells good is really an an image that i'm trying to get through especially in the latter part of this book because family is so important and a reminder that nobody gets through their life nobody completely alone it's impossible um, maybe that person didn't recognize the help others have given them. That's possible. Our own hubris will do that sometimes. Um, and sometimes our own ignorance will do that. Sometimes we don't even know who's helped us. But our family becomes um, such an uh, important touchstone. My family is what keeps me grounded. Um, and it's so funny. I have probably the greatest sense of anxiety in my house when I am trying to do things that my wife can do and make look so easy. Mm-hmm. Like, like it's Effortless. just, yeah, like just muscle memory to her, you know. I can watch her move around in the kitchen and you wouldn't hear a sound. You'd hear the food cooking, you would smell the food cooking, but you wouldn't hear pots falling, you know, you wouldn't hear cussing, <laughs> you wouldn't hear, but, but if I'm in there, I mean, it's like, you know, a freight train. Um, and if you ask, <laughs> if you ask my kids, um, because, you know, I do grill everything, you know, and you can ask him, like, what's the one thing your dad says before y'all sit down to eat something that he's cooked? And they'll probably will say inevitably, guys, I hope this is good. Because <laughs> I say that every single time. Like, <laughs> I'm scared to death, you know. Um, I hope this turns out okay. And they're like, God, dad, this is awesome. This is the best thing I've ever had. And I'm like, okay. Um, you know, but. It's an important reminder. I mean, I, I get so much joy with my kids and, and now my grandson, you know, um, because they throughout the years have given me so much wonderful material for poems. But if you want to see what unconditional love looks like, you know, and I know I know there's unconditional love with Lindsay. I know that for a fact because she, she would have kicked my ass to the curb a long time ago. <laughs> But but with kids, you know, they look to you because you're their parent. And I wanted to foster the kind of relationship that as they grew older, that they would see that, you know, their dad made sacrifices for them, that, you know, their dad worked his ass off for them, but their dad never asked them for anything. You know, I never, never asked them to do something because I've done those things. Now, I tell them to go clean their room or tell them to take the trash out. I didn't ask them to do that, you know, but that's because, you know, I'm the dad, you know, um, but, (laughs) but, but with, with all of the craziness in this world uh, and so much of it is, seems like it's out of control that for me, writing poetry gives me a sense of control, but I have to go to it 
my family gives me a sense of control and I don't have to do a thing in the world. I can just sit back and just be a part of it. So, you know, there are things that my family has given me that have truly been gifts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I wanted the book because it is heavy in some spots and I wanted it to end with the one thing that I think is the salvation is the redeemable factor regardless of our gender, regardless of how we were brought up or where we live. Um, And it's love, plain and simple, love. Ray McManus is a writer based in Lexington, South Carolina, but you already knew that. His new book, The Last Saturday in America, is available now from Hub City Press. Go read it. That's it. Just go read it. I know we went a little long today, but if you stuck around with us to the end, I just want to say thanks. I know we haven't been as consistent with our release schedule of these past couple of months, so I really appreciate that you've been sticking with us while we've gotten this train back on the tracks. I promise we're trying to catch up. To make up for it, we're going to be releasing a few additional episodes this month, so stay tuned for those. But until then, I want to leave you with a poem that I wrote. Roses are red, violets are blue. How many times have I said, my name's producer Drew? See you all next time. You've been listening to Binder, a production of the Columbia Museum of Art. Today's episode was hosted by me, Drew Barron. But really, today was all about our usual host, Ray McManus. Special assistance from Joel Ryan Cook. If you'd like to learn more about Binder or any museum exhibitions and programs, visit our website, columbiamuseum.org.